This video is sponsored by Frome.co. Frome creates beautiful canvas art centerpieces that depict the chromatic chronologies of your favorite films, where each color strip represents the average color of a specific frame at any given point in the film. Place your bets now as to which film this canvas represents. Be sure to use the referral link frome.co slash coldcrashpictures to get 10% off your order. That's frome.co slash coldcrashpictures. I want you to get mad! The mask's not for you. It's to protect the people you care about. Five minutes is enough to put a man over down here. Listen to me. If we break quarantine, we could all die. I had power over nothing. Don't go anywhere. Nowhere to go. I have such doubt. Not a great writer. I need this job. You're saying at this point we should sacrifice more innocent American civilians. Is that right? Sir, if we don't strike soon, there may not be much of an America left to defend. I'm living in America. And in America, you're on your own. America's not a country. It's just a business. Oh, it's a dang business. Oh, the crap, a man insane. They say evil prevails when good men fail to act. What they ought to say is, evil prevails. I think a lot about the Paramount Consent Decrees. See, back in the 1930s, at the height of the golden age of Hollywood, all the major movie studios owned their own theaters. So when Universal, MGM, or say, Paramount made a movie, you had to go to a Universal, MGM, or Paramount-owned theater in order to see it. This was a form of vertical integration, in which every aspect of a film's production, distribution, and exhibition were controlled by a single company, or parent company. Independent theaters were squeezed by this, often forced to accept deals that favored one studio over all the others. And sometimes the deals didn't even favor the theater. Theaters. Studios practiced what's known as block booking, in which they sold movies in bulk. Independent theaters had to purchase a whole bunch of films if they wanted to show any, often without even seeing them first, sometimes before they were even made. The studios were sure to include a couple of big tent poles in the mix, but most everything else was just B-movies and a bunch of little stuff, sometimes literally just short films. Owning your own theaters and selling films in bulk might sound positively quaint compared to what the corporations get away with today, but these practices had massive long-lasting effects on the entire movie business. According to Wikipedia, in 1945, Hollywood studios owned just 17% of all the theaters in the country, but they accounted for 43% of all theater revenue nationwide. In short, they were cleaning up. As far back as the early 1900s, the Federal Trade Commission was already investigating various film companies for possible antitrust violations. And in 1938, the Department of Justice finally filed suit against the eight biggest movie studios in Hollywood, three of which didn't even own their own theaters, but they were still in violation of antitrust laws in other ways. <laughs> The government's position was that all of these studios were vertically integrated oligopolies, a business arrangement in which the competition was being unfairly quashed. And after a decade of litigation, the case made it all the way up to the Supreme Court, which ultimately sided with the government, and ordered the studios to divest themselves of the theater holdings. This consent decree also greatly restricted the practices of block booking and blind buying, which meant that studios had to actually show their films before they were allowed to sell any of them. The effects of the decrees were swift and long-lasting. Independent theaters greatly increased their market share throughout the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. They also started importing more foreign films, which were outside the Hayes Code's jurisdiction, thereby weakening the Code's influence. With the end of their exclusive theater distribution deals, many studios decided to sell or lease their old film catalogs to TV networks, which is how we first got movies playing on TV. One notable holdout was Walt Disney.
But not all the effects of the decrees were good for creative forces. Short films, for example, are almost never exhibited theatrically anymore, not without generating major rewards buzz first. And back when studios practiced block booking, which guaranteed every film a distributor and an audience, studios were arguably more willing to greenlight riskier projects. Whereas nowadays, almost any film with a big national marketing campaign has to have at least a $100 million budget. The exceptions are usually genre pictures like horror. I've been paying close attention to the Paramount decrees for the last couple of years, because it seems to me like much of what the streaming platforms do appears to violate at least the spirit of the decrees, if not the actual letter. AMC isn't the world's biggest exhibitor of movies anymore. It's Netflix, Hulu, HBO, Crackle. Well, not Crackle, but you get my point. And most of these streaming sites don't just exhibit films, they often make their own content and distribute it on their own proprietary streaming platforms. I'm no lawyer, but that sure sounds to me like a form of vertical integration. I mean, what's the material difference between Paramount Pictures only exhibiting films in Paramount-owned theaters and Disney releasing all their content exclusively on Disney Plus? So for the last few years, I've been wondering if the government was ever gonna take another look at the consent decrees and then expand their purview in response to the streaming wars. Laws tend to lag where technology is concerned, but I figured at some point the courts would catch on and then they would decide to update the decrees. Oh, what's that? Oh, they repealed them. Huh. This is true. It was while doing research for a video about the Paramount consent decrees that I first learned that the judge ruled in August of 2020 to terminate the decrees after a two year sunset period, not just in spite of the streaming wars, but in large part precisely because of the meteoric rise of in-home streaming over the last several years. 70 years of technological innovation, new competitors and business models, and shifting consumer demand have fundamentally changed the industry. Major films are released broadly to thousands of multi screen theaters at the same time in a single theatrical run. As internet movie streaming services proliferate, film distributors have become less reliant on theatrical distribution. There are also many other movie distribution platforms, like television, the internet, and DVDs that did not exist in the 1930s and 40s. Given these significant changes in the market, there's less danger that a block booking licensing agreement would create a barrier to entry that would foreclose independent movie distributors from sufficient access to the market. In addition, the Supreme Court has recognized that vertical integration can create efficiencies that lower costs and encourage innovation that often results in better products and lower prices for consumers. How the hell did I miss that? What else was going on in August of 2020? For what it's worth, the order is quick to point out that all the studios are still beholden to existing antitrust laws, such as they are, and the original decree only applied to the original defendants anyway, most of whom don't even exist anymore. So the order is basically just saying that, hey, the streaming platforms are all ferociously competitive right now, despite the fact that none of them are beholden to the original decree, and new technologies have largely nullified the anti-competitive nature of many of the practices that the original decree prohibited anyway so we might as well phase it out. I don't know enough about the business to bet on my own predictions, but my gut tells me that we may not see as many changes in response to this as you might think. Like I said earlier, most of the streaming platforms have been practicing some form of vertical integration for years. The original decrees weren't holding them back, so now that they're gone, why should anything change? Except, of course, everything's changing. 2020 was the most tumultuous year for film production, distribution, and exhibition since the invention of DCPs, multiplexes, synchronized sound. Repealing the decrees was a real this might as well happen moment in a year of everything happening all at once. Theaters closed up shop, movies got pushed back, then delayed, then finally dumped to streaming, sometimes onto a studio's proprietary streaming platform, and sometimes the studios cut deals with third parties for god knows what kind of terms. Individual films came and went with nary a blip on the cultural radar. If they were lucky, they'd spend a couple of days on the Netflix trending page and that was it. It was the kind of year where if you didn't watch something in the five minutes it was trending, or at least add it to your watch list, you probably weren't going to be reminded it existed ever again. <sighs> I'm not doing a top 10 list this year. Longtime viewers of the channel know that I've always been sort of on the fence about them from the beginning. Something about the subjective nature of film analysis and the objective nature of rankings made the whole concept seem fishy from the jump. I basically have to convince myself to do one each year. 2020 was the final nail in the coffin. I mean, I only saw two films that came out in theaters in 2020, both of them before quarantine. It's still not even 10 films total. So I figure if ever there was a year to skip it, this would be the one. 
But that doesn't mean we can't talk about films within the context of a given year. I watched a lot of movies in 2020. Film was more important to me than ever. It's just that the films that left the biggest impression on me in 2020 didn't necessarily come out in 2020. So in lieu of a proper top 10 list, we're gonna talk about some of the films that meant the most to me in 2020. It's my own personal 2020 dumpster fire watch list. Ugh. I'm afraid of America. I'm afraid of the world. I'm afraid I can't help it. I'm afraid I can't. I burned through a whole bunch of quarantine media during my first several months of lockdown. It was Contagion, 28 Days Later, The Thing, Night of the Living Dead, Train to Busan, Sea Fever, Whiteout, Castaway, Repo the Genetic Opera, The Andromeda Strain. You could do a whole video about pandemic media, and people have, but there is one quarantine film that hit me especially hard in 2020 that I didn't see popping up on everybody else's quarantine viewing lists. Perfect Sense is about a plague. A plague that hits the earth and robs everyone of their four major senses one by one. First smell, then taste, then sound, then sight. There's also this really dramatic moment where each lost sense is associated with a few frantic minutes of uncontrollable emotion. Like before you lose your sense of smell, you get really, really sad. I miss him so much. Before you lose your sense of taste, you experience uncontrollable panic and then insatiable hunger. Before you lose hearing, you experience irrepressible rage. Evergreen plays an epidemiologist who can't figure out what's causing the disease despite her and her research team's best efforts. And Ewan McGregor plays a chef whose restaurant threatens to close with each lost sense. I mean, how the hell is a restaurant supposed to stay open without the sense of taste? But then despite all odds, it bounces back. When smell goes, they go all out on seasonings and spices. When taste goes, they concentrate on textures, densities, and temperatures. When hearing goes, people still show up to eat, there's just less shouting in the kitchen. With each new lost sense, there's a frantic moment of societal panic. And then, things settle down. People adapt to the new normal. They keep doing what needs to be done in order to survive. Vision is the last sense to go. In fact, it's literally the last shot of the film. But if you've been paying attention, you realize this isn't the end of the world. They're gonna be fine. It does a disservice to the people that we lost to COVID-19 to draw any direct comparisons between the film and the pandemic. We in the real world are most definitely not fine, but we might be. Maybe. And of all the quarantine media that I watched in 2020, that better reflects my personal experience in lockdown than any zombie apocalypse ever could. I knew the year was starting to affect my viewing habits when I revisited old films and suddenly found new interpretations for them. Take, say, Total Recall. I love this movie. It's probably my second or third favorite Verhoeven. You are not you. You are me. No shit. It tells the story of Douglas Quaid, a low-level construction worker who feels dissatisfied with his simple little life and keeps dreaming of doing bigger and better things on Mars. So he goes to a memory implant company, Recall, and pays to have a memory of Mars implanted in his head. But not just any memory of Mars. You are a top operative, back under deep cover on your most important mission. People are trying to kill you left and right. You meet this beautiful, exotic woman. Go on. I don't want to spoil it for you, Doug, but you rest assured by the time the trip is over, you get the girl, kill the bad guys, and save the entire planet. Then, all hell breaks loose. Basically, Quaid is told he is a secret agent or at least he was, but he's had his memory wiped and a new identity set up for him on Earth so that he can stay out of trouble. But all of his old memories have been resurfacing his dreams, and the visit to Recall further trip things up. And now his old handlers are trying to kill him because he knows too much. So now he's got to elude capture, get his ass to Mars, hook up with the rebels who are fighting for autonomy and independence up there, and bring down the evil corporate plutocrat Velos Kohagen, who's trying to crush them all under his heel. As long as the turbinium keeps flowing, I can do anything I want. Or at least... That's what he thinks is happening. Because at various points throughout the film, Quaid is told he's not actually experiencing any of the things we're watching him do. They say he's back at recall. I'm sorry to tell you this, Mr. Quaid, but you've suffered a schizoid embolism. We can't snap you out of your fantasy. 
But Quaid repeatedly rejects the idea that he's dreaming, and he keeps pressing on, until he finally defeats Cohagen and kickstarts an alien oxygen generator that terraforms Mars, thus saving the oppressed lower classes of the planet in the final moments of the film. Now normally, one of the things I like so much about this film is its deliberate ambiguity. It's not just that we're unsure about whether or not Quaid is a secret agent, it's that every attempt to explain it somehow still supports both possibilities. And I for one never wanted to know for sure. I liked knowing that I could never know. But when I rewatched it in 2020, the whole time I was thinking, oh, he's definitely having an embolism. Like I was absolutely certain. The movie hasn't changed. I have. I don't want to read too much into it. Like, I don't want to be like, this new interpretation means that I despise narrative ambiguity in times of great social stress, or that I'm more willing to accept the possibility of an acute medical emergency in the midst of a worldwide health crisis. I don't want to be that literal about it. I just noticed that my own narrative sensibilities had changed. But by the end of my screening, I was also willing to consider a third option. Quaid is still at recall, but the implant took perfectly. He's fine. Every attempt to convince him he's dreaming is all part of the prearranged backstory that he's bought and paid for. Ah, I get it. I'm dreaming. And all this is part of the delightful vacation your company has sold me. It's not subterfuge. It's simply an attempt to give him as cathartic an experience as possible. Oh, why is he going to have a wild time? <laughs> he's not going to want to come back. <laughs> Which is, of course, the exact same experience I'm going for whenever I put on the film. Not for nothing, but the anti-capitalist sentiment also stood out to me a lot this year, too. The fact that Cohagen is literally commoditizing air. Fuck him. Be a good lesson to the others. Come on, Cohagen, you got what you want. Give this people air. And if the idea of commoditizing the very air we breathe sounds crazy to you, ask yourself why commoditizing food, water, housing, healthcare, or anything else that people need in order to survive is any less bonkers. Wall Street literally started trading water futures in 2020. Water. Like a Morton Joe. Do not, my friends, become addicted to water. It will take hold of you and you will resent its absence. We didn't even reach this point in 2020. Nestle and other corporations' truly vile practice of privatizing water rights has been going on for decades. And that's not the only thing that made me think of Mad Max this year. The first act pretty well captured the feeling of trying to safeguard yourself from personal harm. Look, he's wearing a mask. While a bunch of brainwashed death cult chuds perform their hyper-violent self-immolation rituals at the expense of your own personal health and safety. Kirk Cameron is a war boy, is basically what I'm saying. The whole first and second acts, really, are all about people disregarding or even leveraging other people's safety in order to accomplish their own goals. That's what makes the third act such a revelation to me. Not because they're suddenly driving in the other direction, but because it's wall-to-wall -wall people bending over backwards to ensure other people's safety. Imagine that. Who knew Mad Max Fury Road would have a more optimistic conclusion than 2020? Okay. There's... There's a lot of anti-capitalist sentiment on my list this year. I mean, as anti-capitalist as Hollywood can ever get anyway. To the point where some of you might be wondering, why didn't I just make a video about anti-capitalist cinema? Oh, don't worry, it's coming. In fact, I plan to make it an episode of Sorry in Cinema. But the thing that gets me so much is that while so many people can rattle off a list of all these existential threats to society, be it systemic racism, imperialist forever wars, chronic food insecurity, institutional misogyny, white supremacy, the prison industrial complex, climate change, capitalism almost never makes that list. And that's a problem, because the rest of those existential threats, they're not bugs, they're features of a capitalist economy. It's not that capitalism birthed anything on that list, necessarily, but none of them are going anywhere until capitalism is gone too. I know a lot of you will disagree, but then a lot of you define capitalism without even mentioning capital. Might I suggest that those people read up on what capitalism is before they weigh in? You know what? Whatever. This isn't the video where I try and convince you anyway. Suffice it to say that my idea of a functioning society spends less time worrying about how much Best Buy spends on loss prevention each year than it does child hunger. I saw someone arrested for stealing a packet of tortillas from Jewel Osco on Christmas Eve. If that doesn't radicalize you, then I don't know what will. The Wages of Fear is one of those films that I recommend to people whenever they say they don't like old movies. You'll like this one. 
Wages of Fear follows four European expats living in a remote village in South America, who volunteer to transport two truckloads of nitroglycerin 300 miles through the jungle without any safety precautions. Tensions remain sky high as the film comes up with about a half dozen set pieces which threaten to blow the men to kingdom come at any second. There's this one sequence where they come to an unfinished patch of road, which the first truck decides they're gonna crawl over so as not to jostle the payload. But then the second truck decides to get a running head start and then fly over the bumps at full speed. The first truck can't speed up, and the second truck can't slow down. Now I don't have to tell you how the scene ends, because you're all gonna go rent it tonight and watch it for yourselves. The film's nearly two and a half hours long, but the men don't set out on their journey until an hour into the film. That first hour is spent detailing what kind of living conditions are required in order to get anyone to volunteer for this line of work. In fact, the conditions in the company town are so bad that they don't just volunteer for the job, they actually have to compete for it. Luigi! Thank you! The journey doesn't make any sense without that first hour, because capitalism requires misery. People will try to pawn it off as hard work or paying your dues, but what we're actually talking about here is willfully depriving the people who actually get the job done of the things that they need in order to live, thrive, and survive, just so that some shareholder who's never even seen a time card can pad his investment portfolio. Because if the workers aren't miserable, they won't do the job. Not in this economic system, anyway. People look at the pandemic and they go, the problem is the EPA. The problem is China. The problem is that lockdowns freeze the economy. But that's like watching the wages of fear and going, the problem is unpaved roads. Do the right thing was also on my mind a lot this year. One of the things I find most fascinating about it is that people's reactions to it are almost as interesting as the film itself. For those who haven't had the viewing pleasure, Do the Right Thing takes place over the course of a single day on a single street in Brooklyn on one of the hottest days of the year. Mookie works as a pizza delivery man for Sal's Pizzeria, which is run by Sal and his two sons, none of whom think too highly of their own customers. See, Sal refuses to put any black people up on his wall of fame. Man, ask Sal, right? Hey, hey, Sal, how come you got no brothers up on the wall here? You want brothers on the wall? Get your own place. You can do what you want to do. And it's not even so much that he won't do it, but that whenever Buggin' Out asks him about it, he acts like it's the stupidest thing he's ever heard. But this is my pizzeria. American Italians on the wall only. Temperatures and tensions run high until, at the end of the day, Radio Rahim, Buggin' Out, and Smiley go to confront Sal about how he runs his business. So Radio Rahim refuses to turn down his radio in protest. Sal then calls him the N-word and destroys his boombox. They start fighting, they get pushed into the street, some cops show up, and one of them decides to murder somebody. Somebody not Sal. The cops drive off and leave the devastated residents of the neighborhood facing down Sal and his sons. It's in that moment, when the neighborhood is ready to tear Sal to pieces, that Mookie picks up a trash can and chucks it through the window. When this film first came out, people said it was irresponsible. White people, I should say. White people said it was irresponsible. It'll start riots. Black people will literally start rioting. One of my favorite things about Spike Lee is that he's very often the person who can provide the very best analysis of his own work. His early work, anyway. Can't really speak to the later stuff, but the best analysis that I've ever heard of Do the Right Thing comes from him. June 26, 1989. He's talking about the then mayor, David Dinkins, New York City's first black mayor. And now, unfortunately, Dinkins will have to pay the price for Spike Lee's reckless new film about a summer race riot in Brooklyn. Do the right thing, which opens on June 30th. Now parentheses, and not too many theaters near you, one hopes. Now what the fuck is that? Do white audiences go crazy at that time when they're going to see Terminator 1, Terminator 2, films are that much more violent? Another popular question at the time of the film's release was whether or not Mookie did the right thing by throwing the first brick or trash can, as it were, at Sal's Pizzeria. Spike Lee has said that black people do not ask that. Not one person of color has ever asked me that question. And anytime I read a review by a critic and they talked about 
the loss of property, and not one word was written about the loss of life. So when you read something like that, from the Jump Street, you know where they're coming from. Anyway, if you're wondering what I think the value of Do the Right Thing is in 2020 and beyond, ask yourself, when you watch this film, are you more concerned about the property or the people? I am far from the first person to point out that Jaws rang a little truer to life than usual this year. What with the Amityville mayor's refusal to close down the beach for the 4th of July weekend, despite the very real chance that someone might get eaten by a shark. It's not like he didn't know what he was up against. He had already closed the beach earlier in the film. He didn't reopen it because it was suddenly safer. He reopened because the town stood to lose a lot of money if he didn't. For Christ's sake, tomorrow's the 4th of July, and we will be open for business. It's gonna be one of the best summers we've ever had. It's easy to watch a summer blockbuster and boo the profit-hungry bad guy, but I literally heard three different family members over the course of 2020 say some version of, look, the virus is bad, to be sure, yeah, but the cost of a shutdown is just too much for the economy to handle right now. It's just such a naked display of twisted priorities. Does the economy exist to serve the people, or do the people exist to serve the economy? Oh, hi, Larry. Why aren't you in the water? The economy isn't a biome, it's man-made. We can decide how it works and who it works for. If you're seriously unaware of any other possibilities, might I suggest it's not because other possibilities don't exist, but because you're not looking for them. Whatever, again, there's only so much time I can spend arguing this stuff. If 2020 didn't challenge your pre-existing notions about the world, then there's only so much that mere discourse can do at this point. Perhaps the most telling lesson from Jaws is that the mayor did indeed get re-elected in the sequel. Some of the liberals look confused. They're saying, but Serge, Trump didn't get re-elected in 2020. Oh, did you think Trump was the mayor in this metaphor? Not for nothing, but sea shanties also made a big comeback in 2020. Show me the way to go home, home, home. I'm tired and I want to go to bed. I had a little drink about an hour ago and I got right to my head. Wherever I Cool Hand Luke helped me out a lot this year. Not because it's so uplifting, but in fact, because it's not. They're gonna remind you of what I've been saying. On your own good. Wish you'd stop being so good to me, Captain. Don't you ever talk that way to me. Never! Never! It showcases the full range of my emotional state throughout the last year, and then validates those emotions by dramatizing the conditions that cause them. I don't mean prison. And for what it's worth, I don't consider Cool Hand Luke to be the greatest film about the systemic horrors of the prison industrial complex anyway. That would be holes. But I do consider it one of my favorite cinematic metaphors for capitalist oppression. The way that the cruelty is the point. That all the suffering is manufactured. God, I pray to God you don't get me anymore. That the whole system exists on a foundation of exploited labor. Some of you aren't tracking the metaphor. You think that prison can't serve as a metaphor for a capitalist economy, since society wants to keep people out of prison and in the workforce. Does it? Is that why the U.S. has the largest incarcerated population in the entire world? And it has one of the lowest employment rates of any developed nation? Because our capitalist economy is so good at putting people to work? The hardest working people I know all have three jobs, and they're all still broke. The misery is entirely manufactured. Well, they're supposed to be miserable, aren't they? After all, it is prison. If they wanted to be free, they shouldn't have broke the law. Luke cut the heads off of three parking meters. That is a victimless crime. It reminds me of the people who say we shouldn't try to fulfill people's basic needs because then nobody would want to be a janitor. Which is just wild to me because you're basically admitting that our whole economic system is entirely dependent on underpaying essential workers. But then I guess that would explain why the national discourse went from frontline workers or national heroes to the $15 minimum wage will tank the economy so quick. All I know is that I've never been to prison and yet I experienced every single emotion can contained within this film within the last year. The unending cycle of buildups and breakdowns. How the system doesn't allow you to choose when to rest, so your mind and body eventually choose for you. People will think you've recovered the next time you make it through a normal day, but you haven't. You're literally just not dead yet. Don't hit me. I'll do whatever you say. You only don't hit me. <laughs> You're an original, that's what you are. Them mullet heads didn't even know you was fool. Fooling him, huh? 
you can't fool them about something like that, they broke me. You know how I know when I'm clocking in on borrowed time? When a two-day weekend isn't enough to recover from a five-day work week anymore. When I start dreading Fridays because they're only two days away from Monday. That's when I know it's only a matter of time before my body decides when to take a break for me. But you know what scene got me the most this year? It's the scene where Luke busts out of prison and then sends the guys a photo of himself with two women as a way to show them what a great time he's having on the outside. What's it right and say? Dear boys, playing it cool. Luke. But then he's suddenly dragged back to prison, and when they ask him about the photo, he admits it's a fake. Luke, did you have them both at once? I mean, together? Pictures are phony. Had them made up for you guys. And the guys don't believe him. Time, man. Man, you had a maid. Yeah, what you talking about? Nothing. Made nothing. Had nothing. But I got it here. Oh, come on! Stop beating it! Get out to yourself! Stop feeding off me! Real talk. Sometimes, the time and energy required to write and produce a video takes up about as much energy as I can muster. Sometimes when I hit upload on a video, I'm ready to never talk to anyone about anything I ever make ever again. But I ain't fooling anyone, and Luke ain't fooling me. He needed to send that picture, even more than the rest of the guys needed to see it. I can't draw a straight line between all the suffering that we experienced in 2020 and the plot and the themes of Ready or Not. I just know that I watched it on election night and it was the only thing that brought my blood pressure down. <laughs> How can rich people? Grace is marrying into the Ladomas clan, a family of wealthy board game and sporting goods socialites who insist she participate in an old family ritual on the night of her wedding. You have to play a game. It's just something we do when someone new joins the family. A game. Yeah. Honestly, it means more to them than the wedding itself. That's it? It could be backgammon or checkers. I got chess. I got old maid. Seriously, what the fuck is old maid? But then Grace goes and draws. Is this hide and seek? Are we really gonna play that? Unlike all the other games, which play out like any other family game night, hide and seek requires the death of the Siki. Everything okay? I don't want to give too much away, but let's just say that the family wealth is riding on this. They have to kill her if they want to stay rich. Let the countdown begin. Which serves as the source of much of the film's delightful Mr. satirical Press. bite. Mr. Lodomus, I just saw her run. Oh my god! Because I don't know how to tell you this, but the rich aren't coming to save us. They're not even on our side. People talk about donations to charity, like that's any reason to look up to Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos. But wouldn't you rather live in a world where their charity isn't needed? It's true what they say, the rich really are different. I'll give you a 10 second head start. I wanted to include at least one film on my watch list that attempted to capture the overall mood of 2020. And the first film that came to mind was In the Mouth of Madness. A story about an insurance investigator who watches the world go mad in the days preceding the release of a Lovecraftian horde of demons across the earth. What's so telling about this one to me is that it's less about the fear of any physical danger that he faces, and more about his own psychotic break as he watches the world go mad around him. That was all of us in 2020, right? Cackling in an empty theater not in spite of the world's insanity, but because of it? <laughs> <laughs> but the more I thought about it, the more I thought there was a better representation of my personal experience. Because the more I witnessed and read and listened throughout 2020, much of what was happening felt less like madness and more like something far more predictable than madness, a fulfillment. Melancholia is about a massive rogue planet that's been hiding behind the sun, which scientists predict will pass very close to the Earth, giving us all the scare of a lifetime before it harmlessly passes us by and then makes its way into the outer reaches of space. <sighs> it's so <laughs> it's so but there are some who say the predictions are wrong, that it's gonna hit, that we're all doomed to die. On the weekend of its closest approach, Justine is supposed to get married. And she does. But 
severely. She's suffering from a major depressive episode, which has nothing to do with the rogue planet, and it's totally spoiling the mood for everyone else. But then after the ceremonies are over, we're reminded of the impending flyby, and... Okay, look, this isn't much of a spoiler. I mean, we see what happens at the end of the film in like the first seven minutes. But the scientists? They're wrong. John! And it's in the face of certain doom that it's Justine's time to shine. I'm afraid that the planet will hit us anyway. Don't be. I went through something similar this past year. I spent a good chunk of 2020 absolutely panicked. And then I wasn't. And when I say we're alone, we're alone. Life is only on Earth. And not for long. I'm not talking about being blackpilled. I'm not talking about lie down and rot. I'm simply talking about replacing panic and despair with understanding and acceptance, even if what you're trying to understand is horrifying. Justine doesn't get the chance to take that understanding and try to turn it into joy. But we might. If... What, well, you want me to say it? Come on. If we live long enough. It's a Wonderful Life is a film that I wish my generation took a little more seriously. I'll admit, it's got a lot of crappy fans. I'm talking about anyone who thinks the message of the film is that sadness is a sin. A man down on earth needs our help. Splendid. Is he sick? No, worse. He's discouraged. And that if you would but trust in the Lord, everything will be fine. Jesus is the reason for the season and all that. That's right. But did you know that this film had its very own FBI file in response to its perceived anti-capitalist messaging? The film represented rather obvious attempts to discredit bankers by casting Lionel Barrymore as a Scrooge type so that he would be the most hated man in the picture. This, according to sources, is a common trick used by communists. In addition, this picture deliberately maligned the upper class, attempting to show the people who had money were mean and despicable characters. They're playing my song. For those who haven't had the viewing pleasure, It's a Wonderful Life tells the story of George Bailey, a young man who made big plans for his life. Big, see, I, I don't want one for one night, I want something for a thousand and one nights. With plenty of room here for labels from Italy and Baghdad, Samarkand, Great big, sir. But... His dad runs the local building alone, which is responsible for keeping half the town out of the slums. The evil Mr. Potter's got his sights set on taking down the building alone and then foreclosing on anyone who so much as paints their porch the wrong color. When his father dies, George skips college in order to help run the business. Well, Dr. Kamala, let's get this thing straight. I'm leaving. I'm leaving right now. I'm going to school. This is my last chance. Uncle Billy here. He's your man. But George, they'll vote with Potter otherwise. When there's a run on the bank, he and his wife put up their nest egg to help keep it running. Get on faith. I'm gonna have How much do you need? Every chance he gets to escape town, he gives it up in favor of the common good, until eventually he's married with four kids, but not about to go anywhere or do anything he'd ever planned on doing. Then one Christmas Eve, George's uncle misplaces $8,000 of the building and loan's money, which winds up in Mr. Potter's hands, and he's not about to give it back, which means the building and loan is going under, and George Bailey's going to jail. Where's that money, you silly stupid old fool. Where's that money? Do you realize what this means? It means bankruptcy and scandal and prison. As George weighs the pros and cons of killing himself, an angel comes down and convinces him otherwise. George then settles on what he thinks is the next best thing. I suppose it'd been better if I'd never been born at all. What'd you say? I said I wish I'd never been born. The angel then shows George what the town would look like without him. You've never been born. You don't exist. 
You haven't a care in the world. No worries, no obligations, no $8,000 to get. And besides the fact that there'd be a lot more bars and nightclubs, which actually makes the town seem cooler if you ask me, all of his friends are either dead, dying, or miserable. And what's especially telling to me here is that all their misery is the explicit result of their economic conditions. Look, bud, what's the idea? I live in a shack in Pottersfield. My wife ran away three years ago and took the kid, and I ain't never seen you before in my life, see? Which have been wholesale manufactured by Mr. Potter, which further underscores the point that perpetual profit prescribes misery. George was willing to forego profit for the sake of everyone's collective happiness, and that's what made him so valuable to his community. There's just one thing more, though. This town needs this measly one-horse institution, if only to have some place where people can come without crawling to Potter. When George finally begs for his old life and snaps back to reality, he faces it with renewed resolve and an enthusiastic zeal for the life that he's led, even though for all he knows it's about to land him in jail. Howard! Mr. Bailey, there's a deficit. I know, $8,000. George, I've got a little paper. I'll bet it's a warrant for my arrest. Isn't Wonderful, I'm going to jail! But just before he's arrested, the town comes together, they pool all their money. And wouldn't you know if George isn't able to save the building and loan just in time for Christmas. There are worse fates than George Bailey's. I mean, Donna Reed is a peach and a half. But the thing that struck me so much about this film as a late 20-something was that I had also made a bunch of grand plans for my life. Selling scripts, making movies, maybe one day owning a home gym. But here I am a decade into adulthood, and I'm not any closer to those things than I was when I was an intern as an undergrad out in LA. For all I know, I'm even further from those plans now than I was back then. I spent my 20s working jobs I hated just to pay other people's mortgages. My savings have hit zero three separate times since graduation, despite working 50 hours a week for the last nine years. I feel like I'm running as fast as I can just to stay in the same place. I wrote a version of this speech into a movie script back in 2015, and it still applies. And for all this, I'm starting to wonder if my life isn't turning out to be something not unlike George Bailey's. Except for one problem. I am no George Bailey. I haven't saved any lives. I haven't built a community. I don't even know if I have one. I came up to Chicago because this was the first place I could find work after I graduated college, and I've contemplated leaving for the exact same reason, to find work. I'm George Bailey if he never saw the world or saved his hometown. I can't even count George's failures amongst my accomplishments. I guess you could say the lack of movies this year has got me kind of down, amongst other things. Okay, I know we had movies, technically. I mean, I look at the year in film page on Wikipedia and I can see that we actually got about as many releases as any other year. But they all got dumped online. And that means that... Wait, why would that make a difference? Seriously. Why would it matter that they came out online? How many times have I missed a film in theaters and then watched it online and then it became one of my favorites? Doesn't that happen all the time? Premiering certain films online has been going on for years, and premiering every film online was already common practice halfway through 2020. And by the time the ink was dry in the HBO and Warner deal, it kind of felt normal. After all, this is where the industry's been headed, hasn't it? Isn't that why I've been keeping an eye on the consent decrees for so many years? COVID didn't change the game, it merely fast-forwarded it. When you really think about it, 2020 wasn't a movie leap year, it was a taste of things to come. 2020 wasn't the year without movies, it was the year without movie ad campaigns. And that's a whole different beast altogether. This was a year where we movie lovers were left almost entirely to our own devices with regard to tracking down and choosing which movies to watch. A year where literal, honest to goddess word of mouth got people to tune in more consistently and reliably than anything else. This isn't a lost cause, this is an opportunity. A chance for the worldwide community of filmmakers and film lovers to decide what's worth watching, instead of a bunch of studio marketing departments. Some filmmaker thought that 2020 was going to be their big break, because they made a great film, but then it got delayed, or dumped to streaming, and now they think their career is over because people like me decided that there was nothing worthwhile to watch in 2020. Well, I do not hold to that. Those filmmakers deserve to be celebrated. Oh my god. This isn't the year to skip a top 10 list. This is the first year where it might actually matter, and for everything else, there's mutual aid. <sighs> got my second wind. 
Next video is going to be top 10 favorite films of 2020. This video is sponsored by Frome.co. Frome creates beautiful canvas art centerpieces that depict the chromatic chronologies of your favorite films, where each color strip represents the average color of a specific frame at any given point in the film. This beauty here, possibly the pride of my collection, is Total Recall. Now, I'm usually really big on being like, this stripe here is this scene, and that stripe there is that scene. But what I find so cool about this particular frome is that the entire canvas, taken as a whole, has the same overall look of the color palette of so many different individual scenes. Lines of cold, steely gray interspersed with flashes of bright, bold red. It's like they wanted the color palette of each individual scene to be a microcosm of the film as a whole. Frome canvases are printed at near 8K resolution, and honestly, they look even better in person than they photograph. Frome canvases come wrapped around a lightweight wooden frame that hangs instantly on two or three nails. I live in an apartment where I worry about the integrity of my walls, and these present no problem whatsoever. Frome has over a thousand titles in their catalog, everything from massive hits to obscure indies. And if you can't find the one you're looking for, you can literally just ask them to add it. Frome recently introduced the ability to upgrade your order to a films buff bundle, which gives your canvas a glossy artist quality finish with more vibrant lines and colors, doubles the depth from the wall, and prints the name of the film along the side. This is my fifth Frome so far. I like to rotate them in and out of position above my TV. And they're still the only movie memorabilia that I put on my walls. So if you're in the market for an expertly stylized canvas art centerpiece that says as much about your own taste in movies as it does any given film, Head on over to Frome.co, where you can get 10% off your order by using the referral link Frome.co slash Cold Crash Pictures. That's Frome.co slash Cold Crash Pictures. Got my second wind. Next video is going to be top 10 favorite films of 2020. I hit my ceiling.